All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, a lot. I hope we aren't waiting for a lot of people. So uh, let's start the AMA. I am Marius Mitsius. I am a 15 year old programmer that lives in Greece. And I absolutely love uh, game development. And actually, it is a thing that I started my programming journey. And uh, that are a few things about myself. So, Lucas, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Lucas. I'm, I'm I, I hope, oops. <laughs> Sorry. I'm also uh, 15 years old. I'm from Sao Paulo, Brazil. I like programming and aviation. Uh, in, in Hack Club, I, I help in Sprig. It's it's our we ship you, sorry. It's your you ship we ship project. It's like you you make a game we review and then we send your this console. Uh, and Marius, go ahead. All right, thank you, Lucas. And uh, a few things about Hack Club. Uh, Hack Club is an amazing community that is built around student hackers from all over the world. Basically, it is a network of a lot of uh, coding clubs, more than 400, and people and teenagers especially can connect uh, with multiple uh, hackers across the world. Hackers is a term that we use for the teenagers that are part of the community. Lucas, can you tell us a few things about the AMA? Yeah, today the AMA, as everyone here knows, is with Dave Padilla, Padilla, I don't know how to pronounce your, your. Oh, Padilla, Dave Padilla. Padilla, all right. Dave Padilla, um, he's, he's the creator of Penny Big Breakaway. And we are super excited to ask you questions about game development and these things, you know? Mm -hmm. um, he's also the CEO and lead producer of Evening Star. And now let's start the AMA. Um, when asked, please, please uh, turn on your camera and raise your hand and we will select you to ask. Marius, I think you had some questions. I'm not sure, but... Yeah, okay. So, uh, firstly, I want to start this AMA by some warming up questions that are more uh, generally focused, so we can break the ice between everyone here. Um, Dave, uh, can you introduce yourself to the other high school students in the school and tell us about some interesting facts about yourself? Of course. Uh, yeah, so I guess my, yeah, like I said before, my name is Dave Padilla. I am the CEO and I guess now executive producer at Evening Star. Um, I've been in the video game industry for about I think 22 years. Um, I started as a QA tester, actually. And uh, for those who aren't familiar with that role, it's essentially, you know, somebody that, um, well, for lack of a better word, plays a video game over and over and over again to try to find uh, bugs. Just basically, you know, all of the various issues that usually come up in games before they're released to the public. Um, I did that for a few years um, over at Activision, and then I was able to transition over into uh, to production at uh, Treyarch. So now Treyarch is known for like the Call of Duty, like Black Ops games. Um, but back when I joined them, they were most known for um, a few kind of like sports titles, uh, a couple of things I think that they worked on for Tony, the Tony Hawk series. But also, like their big kind of claim to fame right before I started was uh, these Spider-Man games that were based on like the Tobey Maguire ones from from way back in the day. But uh, yeah, I was uh, I worked production on a couple of Spider-Man games, and um, that just basically gave me a, a taste of video game development, um, especially on the developer side of things. And yeah, since then I've mostly been in production, but um, but for the most part. I've worked in a variety of platforms. I've worked on mobile, um, VR, AR, console, uh, PC, just basically, um, you know, you name it. And I've probably worked on that specific type of, um, you know, tech. But yeah, I mean, but mostly it's been development and it's something that I've been especially uh, proud of. And, you know, thinking back on my career, because I've, I've been focused a lot more on mentorship for the last five years or so. But um, yeah, looking back on my career, like, you know, I... I feel like a you know a bit of it was luck, a little bit was uh, hard work. It was a combination of you know just basically setting myself up to take advantage of a lot of opportunities that were in front of me when I started. But um, but yeah, I, I feel very fortunate about you know especially you know coming up over twenty years in the industry that I've been able to uh, you know to survive. That I've been able to work with a variety of folks that I'm very proud to have worked with. And 
I've been in indie development for about 10 years now. Um, I started my first studio with a couple of colleagues from Treyarch uh, 10 years ago, and then I started a second studio five years ago um, with some folks that I worked with on a couple of Sonic the Hedgehog games called Sonic Mania and Sonic Mania Plus. That's kind of like what put my studio Evening Star on the radar. But um, but yeah, we launched our first original title about a month ago. And yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot to cover over a 22 year kind of like career in the industry, but, um, but you know, I. I find like, I found some success. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, that was my I mean, I forgot. No, no sorry, so sorry. You yeah, no worries. Um, but yeah, so you know, been making games for a really long time. Um, I'm gonna continue making games for a while, and uh, yeah, more than happy to answer any questions that y'all have about it. Well, um, uh, just uh, just one one question. Like, uh, I think uh, you have all this entire career you you probably are saw the most different things and what was the coolest thing that you saw in in the game game development game development in, oh, the coolest thing that i've seen um i mean i think maybe what i would say is one of the coolest things is when i started working in vr or at least, you know, with uh, with VR games, like maybe it was probably about eight years ago or so, or maybe 10. Um, but basically, like, you know, for me, I had heard about VR kind of taking off. Um, you know, I'd heard about Palmer Luckey's kind of, um, you know, his experiments and some of the work that he did with Oculus. But, you know, the first time I put on a VR headset was kind of mind blowing for me. Um, you know, it was heavy equipment, so it wasn't like it was very easy to use. Um, you know, it was tethered. So, you you know, you had a connection to the computer, you had limited motion. But um, but it was just really interesting to kind of see a medium that I've been basically like, you know, playing around with since I was a kid in a in a kind of very new way of, of, of kind of like, you know, interacting with it. So, you know, uh, outside of the fact that, you know, VR tech back then was, you know, very heavy and could get very sweaty. Like for me, it was just like, you know, fascinating to kind of like, you know, explore an entirely different space. And, you know, because of the fact that there weren't a lot of um, video game developers who were creating games for VR at that, mo at that time, um, you know, it was very interesting to kind of like just think about all the different opportunities that were kind of in front of the folks who were using the technology. Um, you know, VR has certainly come a long way since, you know, I first touched it, but I think, yeah, the, the first time I was able to put on a headset and really feel like I was kind of immersed in this world was you know, like very eye-opening for me. Nice, nice. Thanks. Thanks for your, thanks. How do you say that? Uh, I'm, I'm, English is not my first language, so, you know, it's, great. it's great. Uh, so I think the next is Paul. I don't know if I'm pronouncing correct your name, but. Okay, so yeah, um, my name is actually pronounced in a very weird way because English is not my first language and I am from Spain. So you can call me whatever you want. My name is actually pronounced as Pau Fuentes. Really weird, I know, okay. Um, I have a couple of questions that I want to ask you that are when you were in contact with Nintendo, how difficult it was to get in touch with them and what requirements do they um, require to you to launch a game with them? Oh, okay. Well, um, there, in some way, well, that's a kind of easy one. So one of the, the things for that worked out in our favor is, you know, for Evening Star, we've always been focused on premium console titles. So, you know, focusing on PC, uh, Steam PC, focusing on Switch, Xbox, and PS5, or PlayStation generally. But um, but so when you create a game, like there's several different ways that you can bring it to market. Like one of them is that you can self-publish a game. So for instance, if you're on Itch.io or, or even Steam, like you have the ability to create a title and to be able to put it on the storefronts. Um, you know, you can even create a website and, you know, distribute it that way if you really wanted to as well. But, you know, there's a solo um, kind of like path. However, like the, the path that Evening Star takes is that we usually work with uh, publishing partners. So for instance, like Activision is, you know, one of the biggest publishers in the world. You have other studios like, um, you know, like the ones we work with, Private Division, that work with smaller studios. And generally, like publishers um, have a, a relationship with uh, what we call the first party. So Sony, Nintendo, and Microsoft. And, you know, sometimes what ends up happening is that 
when you're you know creating a game and you're working with a publisher, like usually like it ends up being sent over to um, to the first parties as basically like a concept. And the first parties generally um, you know take a look at it, they review it. For instance, with a company like Nintendo, you know they very much take a look at this concept and see like is this something that's a, a, a fit for the Nintendo storefront? So for instance, you typically won't find stuff that's extremely bloody, you know, extremely like mature on the Nintendo storefront. You know, they usually go for like family friendly puzzle stuff, things that are really beautiful and colorful. Um, but um, but yeah, usually the first parties do a review and that kind of, you know, gives them an idea of what you're aiming to achieve. Um, and then, you know, it's just a, a sanity check to see if it, you know, fits for them. So, you know, fortunately for us, because Penny's Big Breakaway is uh, like E for everybody, like we really aim to kind of have it encompass like a wide demographic. Um, you know, it, it was a natural fit, but you know, the fact that we had a publishing partner that had that relationship and kind of helped to kind of make that connection and answer questions is what allowed us to get on the storefront. And I have two more questions for you. Go ahead. Um, oh yeah. I have two more questions for you. One of them is like Nintendo, like make you change something of the game that they didn't like? Um, usually it doesn't kind of work that way. So, you know, when you work with like uh, like companies like Nintendo, um, let's say Nintendo specifically, right? There's a lot of, there's a, a couple of different categories in which they work with developers. Usually there's something called like first party, which is like a Nintendo owned studio. And, you know, usually when Nintendo works with one of their own studios, <laughs> You know they have a lot of um, kind of input into you know what goes into the game and what needs to be kind of what's expected of it. Um, for us, we're we're working with like third parties. So basically, like you know we're independent. Uh, we're not owned by Nintendo. Um, same thing with Private Division. So because of the fact that we're a third party, like you know generally the relationship is one where you know if there's something wrong with the game or if there's something that kind of you know may not really fit with you know their audience, then you know we'll get some input. But it's more of a kind of, um, you know, a hands-off relationship where, you know, we work a lot closer with our publishing partners to kind of dictate what goes into the game. And, you know, usually for a studio like Evening Star, you know, we try to make sure that, you know, we're driving the creative, but that's always within kind of like the, um, you know, the framework of making something that, you know, our studio typically makes and not something else. So I would say that like, you know, Nintendo and given our specific relationship with them was just very involved in making sure that, you know, the game was high quality enough to be on their storefront. Okay, thank you. And the last thing of all I had prepared, um, when you were doing the resources optimizing of the game, did you do it in any creative way or special way? When we were doing what? Um, optimizing the game. Ah, uh, sort of, yeah. Um, did we have to do anything special or creative? So we actually um, have our own engine. Like, so one of my business partners, uh, Christian Whitehead, has been basically like creating an engine for the last, I mean, I, mean, I guess now it's a little over 10 years. But um, because of the fact that we have our proprietary engine, it means that we're the ones who are responsible for fixing it. We're the ones who are responsible for making sure that you know, that we're building all the tools, that we're building all the the kind of like the pipelines and technologies that feed into the games that we make. Um, so in terms of like creative work, you know, a lot of it, you know, came down to, you know, at the very start, really figuring out the type of game that we wanted to make. And, you know, from then it was just basically a, a kind of a process of really figuring out, like, you know, given our own tech stack and given our own technology, like, what was it that we had to do to kind of, you know, get the artwork in there? You know, what kind of tools did we have to create for the level designers? And it became this certainly this whole thing over a, a matter of several years of, you know, making sure that our our technology allowed us to make a game like Penny's Big Breakaway. So I, I would say that, you know, in terms of like, you know, creative kind of, um, you know, processes and stuff like that, it was, you know, it wasn't any kind of like one thing that really allowed us to make the game that we made. You know, it was a basically like a series of discussions, you know, a series of kind of um, of, uh, of experimentation, you know, a lot of hits and misses to kind of like figure out what works for our team, what kind of allowed us to kind of create a game that we thought was, uh, you know, high quality and, and, and fun. So, I mean, I think it just generally came down to, you know, communicating internally and really figuring out what it was that we needed. You know, there were a lot of kind of out of the box engines like Unity Unreal that you know, have a lot of tools. And I think in a lot of ways, like, you know, it's really cool to kind of like dive in there and, you know, buy stuff from the asset store to figure out how you can put something together. But for us, it, you know, it wasn't a matter of taking a look at like 30 tools and seeing what worked best for us. It was really trying to figure out what we wanted to make and then building the technology to kind of make that happen. 
Okay, thanks. Sure. And that was Powell, right? All right. Uh, all these questions, uh, this question was really interesting. And uh, it's really interesting to see how publishing can be so difficult yet requires so many connections at the same time. And our next con uh, our next question is from Darren. Is it true that game designers are underpaid and overworked? You know, I I think in talking to every designer I've ever worked with, that's probably true. Um, no, I mean, I think, you know, the reality is that, um, you know, every situation is very different. Um, you know, I've met very, a lot of various game designers or just game developers in general who, you know, are pretty comfortable with, you know, their their pay or, or you know, their hours and stuff like that. It, it just generally really kind of comes down to like, you know, the their, their, their job, really. I mean... Um, you know, I, I would say that, you know, when you kind of compare like smaller studios and bigger ones, you know, like oftentimes if you're working on, let's say a, a bigger, you know, studio doing like a Call of Duty, for example, like, you know, that usually requires a lot more work, especially towards the end, because those types of games are a lot more complicated. So, you know, it's it, any kind of like video game, like um, endeavor is like really hard to predict from beginning to end about how it's going to pan out. And especially with the bigger ones, there's a lot of moving pieces that really don't really, you know, come together until like, maybe the last year or so. So, you know, sometimes when that happens, like folks just have to kind of scramble to kind of like, you know, catch up in regards to seeing how everything kind of, you know, finally works when you have all the pieces, you know, sometimes you find out that things aren't fun. Um, you know, what oftentimes happens with bigger um, companies though, is like, you know, um, there's usually like a marketing push to really make sure that you're locked in with a date for release. And when that happens, you know, it's very hard to kind of like move the date back for, you know, another month or another six months. Like there's a lot of kind of cascading effects that happen when you change a release date. So when a release date is immovable, I mean, it unfortunately means that sometimes like folks have to like work extra. Um, you know, I'm not going to say that that's not something that happens with smaller studios, you know, because games are a creative endeavor. It's just, you know, again, impossible to predict what's going to happen at the very end. But um, I would say it just generally comes down to like, you know, a, a studio's ability to kind of scope appropriately to make sure that, you know, when there are times that, you know, that are going to require extra um, effort from people that you're, you know, either cutting things or, you know, bringing in extra folks to help out. I think, you know, generally like, you know, the, the game industry is trending in a direction where, you know, there's uh, less crunch than there used to be 20 years ago. But I think you know, in some ways, there's also more just because, you know, the stakes have changed, games have gotten a lot bigger now. And, you know, I think as long as you have games that are, you know, five, six year plus like endeavors, like you're going to find that people are just working a lot. And and, and that's yeah. true for every discipline, not just like game designers. Yeah, that's super interesting uh, to see, to uh, see how, uh, how big a game studio is. Uh, that that kind of affects how overall uh, overworked and underpaid they are in a sense. But yeah, that's actually really fascinating and gives a lot of insight to uh, the game development community. Our next question from the chat is from Eshe, I think. It's I don't know how to pronounce it, sorry. But do you think it is worthy to devote your time to creating a game? As an indie developer and not a part of a of a company. Oh, you mean like uh, just do it independently? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, you know whether you make a game by yourself or, or you know with other folks, like I think it's always worth you know kind of flexing the creative muscles and kind of like trying to figure out how something is put together. And that's you know whether you know you want to stay in the industry and work for a company or whether you want to kind of keep doing it as a hobby. Like, you know, I, I think. I, you know, personally speaking, I, I think it's always worth the effort, you know, whether it's that or whether it's some other kind of hobby. Um, so I would say yes. All right. Uh, that's actually fascinating. I wanted to be an indie developer for a really long time, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we're also moving on from that question. And I'm going to remind everyone that if they want a question they want to ask, they can either raise their hands or type in chat. Yeah. Oh, uh, and maybe, and... Um, oh, sorry to interrupt. I also, sorry, I, I'm just looking to look at the meeting chat to yeah. see this question. So, I mean, I guess there's maybe something else that I'll throw in there if for folks that want to kind of uh, continue doing their own thing as an indie developer. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I've kind of like have learned over the years, especially when I've been doing like self 
development or have tried it is that you know I've, I've always suggested oh, kind mm -hmm. of trying to build things and, and kind of like learning from your mistakes as soon as possible um you know especially like let's say for me like my background is in, in programming and i've kind of i tried it you know uh, a long time ago and i just found that i didn't have the the kind of like the aptitude that i wanted to have as somebody who was thinking of trying it out but um but you know i've, I've gotten my hands dirty with a lot of a lot of different things you know like i've really got into visual scripting a few years ago um you know also kind of like you know bought stuff off the storefront and you know just kind of try to do my own little, like little mini games. But, you know, the thing that I kind of took away from it is that, you know, I was always willing to kind of like take a look at something critically and kind of like throw it away when it didn't meet my kind of like criteria or when I feel like I learned enough from it. And I think, you know, as a, as a solo um, developer, especially at the beginning stages of your career, I think it's, it's, it's great to not, you know, be too kind of married to an idea or to a technology or to a way of doing things. I think, you know, getting in there and just trying a variety of, of tools, you know, like trying stuff like Godot or trying Unity or, you know, even trying to build like your own engine is always worth the effort, um, especially like if you are going to work with others. I think having that kind of, you know, that varied view on how, you know, this complicated type of, you know, project is put together is always a worthwhile one. All right. So I think the next question is from Josias. Uh, hello, Dave. Um, I'm Josias from Cameroon, and my question is: um, You mentioned that initially you worked, um, you weren't making original titles at the studio that you were working at, and that Penny's Break Big Breakaway is the first original title. So, my question is: What challenges did you face moving from making games for clients to betting on your own original game? Like, did you stop getting clients? Mm -hmm. um, or you started more as a side project and did you have to maybe make changes in your tech stack or things like that? Oh, okay. Well, um, I think for us, like, so what I mentioned earlier is that like um, my co-founders and I started Evening Star after we had worked together on Sonic Mania and Sonic Mania Plus, which was, you know, a licensed title, uh, you know, Sega owns a Sonic franchise. So for us, you know, it, it kind of was a stepping stone to just, you know, be able to kind of create the studio. Um, from there, you know, and I think when when we started, like, you know, there was always like a goal that we had in mind of creating original titles. And that was something that, you know, we knew what we wanted to do. However, you know, in our specific situation, we found ourselves, you know, um, in a place where, you know, very fortunately, there were a variety of folks who had reached out to us about working with, on licensed stuff. So, you know, we, we'd always kind of imagined that we would keep working on licensed games. Um, you know, if they interested up interested us, and if they were a good fit for the uh, for the studio itself. So, like for instance, with Evening Star, like we're extremely good at platformers. Um, you know, I think we've shown through Sonic Mania and Penny's Big Breakaway that you know we're capable of creating platformers in two D and three D space. Um, which is why you know you probably wouldn't find a studio reaching out to us to create like a licensed like racing game and stuff like that. So you know we always wanted to be very particular about the licensed stuff that we wanted to work on. However, you know in the transition to working on original IP, I think the the you know the biggest challenge was really you know coming up with an idea that we would feel would resonate really well with audiences. Um, you know over the years since we had first pitched Penny's Big Breakaway and for you know from when we started working on it. You know, I think we always knew that there was a kernel of, of something good in it. And, um, you know, I think for us, there was a lot of validation in first, you know, getting the project signed, um, but also over the years, just kind of seeing it put together in all of our milestone deliveries and getting feedback that, hey, like this was actually something that uh, that people felt was, you know, going to find some kind of success in the market. Um, but it wasn't really until I think, you know, as a for the team as a whole, that it really clicked until we started doing like focus testing. Um, and that's basically, you know, for those that aren't familiar with focus tasks, it's basically where, you know, people kind of come together to play a game that's like an alpha or still in development generally, but basically, you know, provides feedback for developers to kind of like let them know like, hey, is the art style fun? Do people think that the game is fun in general? Like, do they like the characters? Do they like, you know, do they find it easy to move around? And, you know, for us, like, you know, internally, like we always imagined that the game was good, but I think getting it in front of, of strangers for the first time was very eye-opening and validating. Um, so, I, you know, I think the thing is, it's like, yeah, you know, going back to what I said earlier, like, I think the biggest, you know, hurdle was just kind of having the confidence as a studio that, you know, is what we were making going to be fun. And when we first started getting it hands-on with folks, I think that's when it proved uh, to actually be the case. So, you know, in some ways you never really know, um, you know, nobody sets out to make a bad game or anything like that. You know, everybody wants games to be successful or be fun or be creative or to inspire others. 
Um, but sometimes it's it's really kind of hard to know from the beginning how it's going to pan out. But, you know, fortunately, like I work with a lot of talented folks who are really good at what they do. So I think that helped increase the chances, but it wasn't until we put it in front of people that it really kind of, you know, where we saw that there was a, the possibility that I was going to do well. Thank you. Of course. All right. So the next is Arthur. Arthur, right? I uh, I also don't know how to pronounce your name. Arthur. All right. Like, yeah. Uh. So my question is like, how do how do you come up with the ideas and or like how is the ideas flow? I guess in um, like commercial game development. Well, I mean, I think ideas, you know, generally like, you know, the ideas that you have kind of are, um, you know, hit close to home. Like, so for instance, like for us, like we we do enjoy a variety of games. Like, I mean, even though I work on platformers, like I love RPGs, like I love first person shooters and team shooters. Like, um, and, you know, but the thing is, is like, you always kind of like try to come up with ideas that really play to your strengths. Um, so for us, like, um, and using Penny's Big Breakaway as an example, like, you know, there was a lot of questions that we had when we were trying to come up with, uh, with you know, an original IP idea where it was like, all right, well, we're good at platformers. Like, how can we come up with novel and inventive mechanics that allow people to, like, move around in a, in a fluid way? And, you know, I, I think around that period of time, too, like, one of our, I think our creative director was, you know, kind of taking a look at, like, um, uh, yo-yos, um, especially, like, yo-yos as they were used in, like, the 17th century, and we discovered that, like, you know, the, like, um, the aristocracy was really into yo-yo. So then we had a kind of an idea of like, well, what if there was some kind of like marriage of a uh, yo-yo and have it be this thing that kind of allowed you to move in 3D space, but also like, you know, have an art, have the artwork kind of play into like the way the aristocrats used to dress in the 1700s with their kind of like fancy and flaring outfits. Um, so it was just kind of a confluence of, of a lot of different things that just, you know, fortunately kind of came together. And then, you know, as we talked about it as a group and, you know, as people sketched it out and really kind of fleshed out the, um, you know, the kind of core design that it really kind of like took shape, you know? So for us, it's not like there's somebody who's like, you know, like, I want to make this game and I'm going to make it happen. It's more that, you know, we kind of like came together as a group to just throw around a lot of different ideas and, you know, the ones that stuck really play to our strengths. And that's not to say that there aren't, you know, people, especially solo devs, <laughs> who have those ideas. But I think oftentimes, you know, you kind of like take a look at the stuff that, you know, you feel that you could do really well and kind of, you know, create in such a way that it makes an impact in the market. Um, you know, there's a variety of kind of like business cases that you can then build from there, you know, to see if, you know, the game might have legs when you release it. Um, you know, like, so for instance, you know, like I, we wouldn't make another kind of like, you know, first person shooter set in like, you know, modern day, like, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, you, we wouldn't make a Call of Duty, right? Just because the thing is, is like, there's a good chance that for a studio like ours, it may not be very successful, but, you know, I mean, there's a variety of things that you can do, but I think, you know, from a design perspective, like a lot of it really kind of comes down to just throwing out some ideas and seeing which one sticks. Um, you know, sometimes the, the idea that resonates with you may not do the best in the market, but, you know, I find that that, that can be fine sometimes. Um, maybe more the case if you're a solo dev, but for us as a, as a studio, and, you know, now we have like 22 employees, like, you know, sometimes there is an element where, you know, we kind of take a look at things critically, not just from a creative perspective, but also from a, a business perspective too, to make sure that it is some, something that can have legs. That's cool. I feel like I've been kind of looking at it backwards where I'm like where I'm like looking at uh, a bunch of ideas and then seeing uh, like instead of looking at my strengths and seeing and like throw and then based on that throwing about out a bunch of ideas and seeing which ones stick. I feel like I've been kind of doing it backwards and just throwing out a bunch of ideas. And then after I find one that resonates with me, seeing if it plays to my strengths. Well, you know, and the thing is, is like, you never know, like, maybe you do work on an idea that isn't playing to your strengths, and it becomes a strength. Like, I think, you know, especially when you're, you know, a bit younger, and I think when the risks are are probably a lot more tolerable, because, you know, you don't have to necessarily worry about, you know, making games to kind of put food on the table, like, you should be taking risks, you should be trying different things out. Um, you know, try the things that, you know, make you feel very scared, and, um, you know, try out the ideas that, you know, may not sound good on paper that, but maybe like are fun to play. So, so I think playing to your strengths is something that you can definitely do, but I think, yeah, when, when you have the ability to kind of like take those creative risks, you should definitely do it.
Next. Um, I have a question. And I was wondering, what would you do if you came across a bug? You tried to debug it, and for hours and hours, you just can't solve it and can't mm -hmm. find the bug. Well, um, <laughs> there's different things that you can do with uh, commercial games. Like, um, you know, oftentimes, like, there is, you know, what I mentioned a while ago is, like, you know, if you have, like, a... a a commercial release date in mind, you know, you obviously want to make sure that your, you know, your game is as bug free as possible and that, you know, you're basically tackling like the, uh, the kind of most critical issues first, but, you know, oftentimes like games are, you know, and it's just a kind of fact of life that games are released with bugs. Um, what you hope you always do is that you hope you find the bugs. Um, I think it's always important to make sure that, you know, that you can kind of test as thoroughly as possible. And, you know, testing can be an art in and of itself, especially if you start taking a look at like PC games, just because there's a variety of, of ways that different, you know, hardware configurations can really affect a game's performance and a game's stability. But, um, you know, sometimes it really kind of comes down to just, uh, you know, making some, some tough calls about, you know, what you do with the bugs, like, you know, if they're extremely critical and, you know, will prevent people from like playing the games, those are, you know, usually the ones that you tackle first. If they're bugs where it's like, hey, you know, maybe this, um, you know, maybe this oil drum is green instead of purple, like you live with it um, and maybe you fix it like down the road. But, you know, usually when you have bugs, you, you do have like a, a kind of, you assign them a priority, right? And you kind of figure out like what the severity is like, you know, is this a very important bug that is going to affect everybody's like, you know, ability to finish the game? Or is this just something that is, you know, kind of like, you know, it, it sucks, but you can like live with it. Or is it something that's extremely trivial? Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think you always make a determination and, you know, with uh, studios like ours that work with publishing partners, you know, it can often be a conversation of like, all right, like, you know, do we think that this is like worthwhile enough to invest more time into it? Um, you know, I would say that there have been bugs in my career where, you know, you kind of ha you work on it for weeks and then you kind of put it down and you try to address it down the road. Um, you know, when I was at Treyarch, like there were moments where, you know, we would be testing a bug or try to reproduce a bug to get it to happen like over and over again over the matter of, of days. And then you have folks who come over and they try to debug it on your machine and nobody can find anything. And it's not until like five in the morning where somebody realizes that there's a fix and you fix it. Um, so I don't know. I mean, there's a, a variety of things that you can do. I mean, I, th I think, you know, developers always want, you know, game their games to be bug free. You know, that's not often the case, but um, I don't know. You know, you kind of make a decision about whether you're actually going to fix it at some point down the road or, you know, or not. Um, but it, I think with publishers, it always comes to conversation. Oh, I was also wondering how... How do you hire new people to work for your studio? Like, do you uh, just read over their resume, just like a traditional one? Or is it more coding where in an interview, you give them a coding problem, like something on lead code, and mm. you let them try and solve it? Or is it a submit a project kind of thing? Well, I mean, I, I think it really depends on the role that you're hiring for. Um, so I, in addition to my like CEO and, and production duties, I also do hiring. I mean, we're a small studio. So, you know, like the co-founders wear a variety of hats and I wear the most administrative hats. Um, you know, when I, when typically I start the hiring process, like a lot of it is just, you know, comes down to like figuring out at the very beginning, like what is it that your project actually needs, right? Like, do you need more artists? Do you need more programmers? Um, you know, do you need production staff or do you need designers um and from there you kind of like you know uh, really tailor the experience to them like there's stuff that is common across like all the different disciplines like so for instance like a resume uh, certainly needed um in this day and age like having a linkedin is important um i would say social media having a social media account outside of like linkedin may not be very important but i think it's always important from a professional perspective to make sure that you don't have anything to uh too inflammatory, but um, but uh, but anyways, like you know, so there's a variety of kind of like different materials that you request from folks, right? Um, the resume being like the most standard one, and then from there you kind of like drill down into specifics based on a person's background. So like so, for instance, if we're hiring an artist, a, a portfolio is extremely necessary. We need to see like their ability to create art in a style of games that we make. Uh, for programmers, and this is actually something that's been uh, I think very interesting to look at in the last like five to 10 years, but, you know, typically like when we hire programmers, we definitely look for a resume. 
Um, however, the next thing that we, you know, like look for as well is to see examples of their code. Um, so like, so for instance, like usually when we have like our programmer positions open, we also have a little line at the bottom asking for resumes and for like a GitHub um, link as well, just because, you know, sometimes it is important to kind of like see how well like folks write their code. Um, you know, I'm not going to speak to like, you know, the, the the various kind of like formatting and structural stuff that our, our lead programmers usually desire from the people who work on our projects. But, you know, like people who write clean, efficient code are the ones that kind of like stand out the most. Like, you know, you also see like how much they've contributed to projects and stuff like that. You know, is are they a solo developer and just did everything from scratch? You know, have they worked with a team of 20 and only kind of like touched like audio? Like, I think seeing those kind of examples like really kind of give you a little bit more in insight into like somebody's kind of experience and, and, and how they kind of like code as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like, I, I think the standard thing is like, yeah, everybody has a resume and, you know, the resume really speaks to their experience. And then from there, you really kind of hone in on, you know, the requirements based on their background. All right. So thanks for your, your, yeah, sorry for that boring answer. answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just one, one last question. We, we need to do an announcement. Uh, just, just, uh, in some minutes. So I will ask you for a, a more a short answer, like, um, because, you know, if, if not, we will end this, uh, like, uh, in two hours, you know, like, and also, uh, um, also if, if we can, I need to ask if, if after, after the AMA, uh, we had some questions that wasn't answered because of time. So we can send to you by email or something. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm always uh, more than happy to hop on another call as well if there's a some variety of questions. Uh, I usually find myself, especially given the the kind of mentorship work that I do, like in, in calls a lot to just kind of give advice. So yeah, whatever format works best for the club. Nice. And I think Thomas has a question. Oh, yeah. OK, very quick question. Um, but for context, I make uh, like pretty obscure, just random little VR games. I'm just like sort of just getting started with game development. Um, awesome. And just like in Unity with my friend, we'd like just build these little obscure VR stories. Um, I've not really found out how to make something that like has a good game loop and is fun. I'm just curious for you, like where do you get the inspiration for like what makes a good game loop? What makes a game actually fun? Um, how do you come up with those initial ideas that sort of get the ball rolling? Yeah. Um... Well, I mean, it's I mean, it's done in a, a lot of different ways, I guess, you know, using our specific game for an example, as an example, like, you know, a lot of it really kind of comes down to um, so, you know, for us, like we wanted to make a kind of momentum based like 3D platformer. So, um, you know, that was like one of the earliest things that we try to knock out probably in the first like six to nine months of development, which was, you know, how does a 3D capsule like move in space and how do you make it feel like fluid? You know, how do you kind of have it jump around between like you know, these various kind of like platforms, you know, in such a way that, hey, like, look, it, it you know, the, the movement does feel fluid, you know, like jumping, like quick dashing, like all that stuff feels fun. Um, and a lot of it kind of like comes down to like, you know, like really figuring out like what, what are the kind of like core mechanics that you want to focus on, right? Like, you know, you don't want to have a game that has like, you know, these 30 different features, like, you know, you want to kind of make sure that like the core of it is, is really fun. And, and for us, like, you know, we determined that like, yeah, that that phys that momentum based movement was really important. And we kind of try to drill into that as immediately as possible. Um, you know, the other reason why, too, is because that has like a huge effect or had a huge effect on like, you know, the way that we constructed all the levels. So having to kind of determine that as quickly as possible was very important for us. And I think, you know, in terms of like, you know, the game loop, right, like, um, you know, using like a I don't know, like a, a card game as an example, right? Like, I mean, let's say like blackjack and stuff like that. Like, let's say you want to make a blackjack game. Like, you know, the, the core game is like, you know, pretty straightforward. The rules have been known for decades. But, you know, if you always wanted to add a twist to it where like maybe it's just something that, you know, has, I don't know, like 
you know, a specific mechanic, you'd focus on that first to just kind of like figure out whether it's fun, whether it does anything interesting to kind of make it a cool game. And I think, you know, you always kind of like start small, right? Like you don't try to do everything. Like, you know, you kind of just try to, you know, uh, figure out this little, you know, small snippet of it that, you know, has that kernel of what the get rest of the game is going to look, look like, and then, you know, focus on that. Like, I think a lot of developers make a mistake of just trying to put a bunch of things together and then figuring it out, like, you know, a few months down the road, like try to kind of like figure out that fun thing, like that one or two things that like make it really interesting and, you know, do that quickly. And then, you know, I mean, if you find something fun, then great, build from that. Um, if you don't, maybe, you know, consider throwing it away. But I think, you know, having the ability to kind of, you know, determine whether it's a, a thing you want to keep as soon as possible is an important aspect of development. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I mean, especially, I guess, you know, in the context of, of VR games, I mean, I think, you know, VR is probably in an interesting place where, you know, you aren't going to probably find like a lot of, uh, I guess, you know, team-based shooters, first person shooters in it, just because, you know, the technology isn't necessarily, I would say like there and people are very different, you know, react to VR differently. But, um, you know, from having, you know, looked at a variety of VR games over the years, like, you know, I think, you know, similarly to like making games on other platforms like it really kind of comes down to kind of like figuring out what that core experience is going to be like first and then just kind of building from there and you know trying to do it as, as simply and quickly as possible so we need to do the announcement because the time is you know <laughs> Uh, so I think Graham or Josias will. Hello, I can also do it, Lucas. Sorry, I can also do it. Can do it. All right, all right, all right. All right. So, uh, basically, uh, because uh, of this AMA and this amazing opportunity, uh, the Sprig team has decided to create an asset pack, and uh, basically, an a theme. Uh, modeled after the uh, modeled after a pen's big breakaway so uh, let me show it to y'all really quickly uh, right one minute if it wants to work all right so basically we have an as we have made an as pack that uh, features a lot of the, uh, if I understand correctly, the characters. Like yeah. we got some penguins, we got the, we got Penny, we got uh, some ground tiles, we also got an enemy, the penguin. And if I recall correctly, we also have a background that uh, isn't real that we can't show yet because I haven't implemented it in the map. We also made a spring theme that's modeled after the game. So that's really cool, especially this icon right over here. I really like it. So this, this is a theme in the Sprig editor that pe people can choose now to kind of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, make uh, it special. honor of the game. I would also note that the, the sprites uh, that were releasing in that asset pack were made mm -hmm. by a hack clubber. Um, can we highlight uh, the name of the person who did that? Is Sean on the call? Yeah. Uh, let me see. Um, you can, uh, if you're on the call uh, before I find you, you can uh, raise your hand up because uh, I'm looking for man. We will uh, follow up this, I guess, with an announcement. Yeah. Um, okay. We that. also, yeah. yeah. So I expect an announcement on Hacklub soon about the theme and asset pack and how you can get it and use it on one of your projects. Mm -hmm. uh, before we end, we have some time for uh, a few more uh, Q&A uh, questions. I think we should touch on one more thing. Mm -hmm. uh, which is this asset pack is actually uh, part of a competition that we will run. Um, if you use this asset pack in the development of your Sprig game, not only if it's your first Sprig game that you're doing, will you get your Sprig device um, as is customary, 
but you will be in the running for a copy of uh, David's game here. Um, we have five copies that David has generously offered um, codes for. I would note, I believe it's Windows only. Um, is that correct, David? You can yeah, Steam. Me. It's for Steam. For Steam. So that is a caveat. Be aware. But you can simultaneously get your uh, Sprig device and get a free copy of this game, which would be super cool. We will vote on who makes the best games with these uh, assets. And so we hope you have a lot of fun with it. Sorry, right. uh, Lucas, Marius? Yeah, Go. okay. So uh, as Graham said, uh, it's going to be a really cool opportunity for first time Spring uh, users and even uh, people who have returned Spring to try it again. And yeah be possible in the running for one of the five games. And uh, I, we got a question from Arthur. Uh, i just like to say that, as far as I know, many uh, Windows games can run on Linux, at least for Steam, with the Proton emulation layer thing. Although I'm not, although I'm not sure about the specific game. I know you can at least enable, like, experimental, or, like, just force it to try to run it even if it doesn't work, but... I think I heard someone say that this was on a good list. Okay, uh, cool. Your Just game. But I, 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 yeah. No promises, but I yep. did hear that today, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to bring it up, so, yeah. All right, and uh, moving on, we got... Uh, sorry, Joseph, I, I, I didn't see your question, uh, but what programming languages should I start learning? I already am relatively fluent in JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, and a few Python made in small games, but what languages, libraries, or engines I should learn not to pursue a good career in game development? Ooh, hold on. I, I, I just saw it in the, the chat. Let me look it over. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, uh, use the language that you feel most confident in. Um, you know, I think a lot of folks, uh, you know, like just, I guess, as an example, I mean, for us, like, you know, we are like, we use C++. Um, there's a variety of other scripting languages as well that we've kind of like looked at, like uh, like stuff like AngelScript, like Lua for game development. And we ultimately just kind of like settle on, you know, what is kind of like the best for the games that we make. Um, and the thing is, is like, you know, a lot of folks just kind of like tend to be very, um, you know, laser focused on, you know, their specific like, you know, language of choice. And that's totally fine. Um, you know, but I think at the end of the day, it's just kind of like, you know, take a look at the languages that allow you to make the games that you want to make. Um, you know, I, I would say that, you know, traditionally, like, you know, like in the video game industry, like you'll find that like, you know, stuff like yeah, C Sharp, like C++. Um, those tend to kind of be the heavy hitters. And a lot of it is just based on whether you're using stuff like Unreal or using Unity. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's just kind of like a program programming language unless like, you know, you are going to get very, you know, deep into like, you know, kind of like low level, like programming, like is, is just something that, I don't know, you should experiment with, you know, what you feel most comfortable and confident in. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's just like a, another tool that allows you to make games. So, I mean, I would say like, don't be married to, to anyone. I would find, you know, I've found that, you know, especially like over the years, you know, a lot of programmers just kind of like stick to their language of choice and just kind of don't take a look at a variety of things. And that's totally fine. I mean, it's just, it really comes down to like, you know, the, the kind of direction that you want to take and what you want to build. Yeah, part of this that, my computer does not souped up enough to run most engines. And even then at this point, cause I've been using these languages for a long time. I, it's, it's harder. It's almost harder to learn an engine than it is to just use to make base web game, like web games out of pure text, like just text to the document code. Mm -hmm. And I just was wondering if there's a, a better way, if there's like a better way to go about that. Ooh, I mean, I'd probably have to ask, but I mean, I think, you know, ask like our our, our, uh, our programmers, but I would say like, you know, if you are making like, you know, web-based games, like I think they, the kind of important kind of like takeaway from there is just being able to kind of create games in general and being able to kind of create something that, you know, that you feel like, you know, happy about. Um, because the thing is, is like, you know, down the road, you could find yourself with like better tech and, you know, you can certainly kind of, 
you know, um, shore up your programming knowledge to kind of accommodate that, uh, you know, that better technology. But, you know, the thing that doesn't really change is your ability to kind of come up with, you know, cool ideas and execute on them. Like, you know, like, sure, the tools may change, but I think, you know, having a, a kind of like working on the fundamentals of just being able to translate stuff that is in your brain to like paper and being able to kind of execute it and make a game. I think that's like an important thing that's going to encompass whatever language you decide to make or decide to use rather. Thank you. So we need to end. We, we, we are almost. Oh, in... I have another question. So sure. as a co-founder and CEO, how do you lead and what are your, what do you think are your strengths in leading when it comes to like leading so much people? No, oh, um, you know, I think my strength over the years has really just been in, in kind of accommodating a, a wide variety of personalities and, and uh, just, you know, uh, people in general, like, I mean, I guess one thing that I didn't really get into is when I was a teenager, like um, I was very into the arts. Um, I was a bit of a theater kid, but, you know, luckily I kind of grew out of that once I realized I wasn't really good as an actor. But, um, you know, but I was I was very into like, you know, stuff like orchestra and, and just kind of like, you know, um, you know, things that allowed me to interact with and work with others. And, you know, over the years, like especially for somebody who is um, very much an introvert. Like I, you know, like having the ability to kind of like really like listen and interact and work with others was a muscle that I've kind of like have built over the years. And I think I had a, a solid foundation from just kind of exploring a lot of like team based activities when I was a, a teenager. And over the years, you know, I think that has just allowed me the, the opportunity to kind of like really, you know, work with others in a way that allows me to kind of help them grow and help them kind of achieve the the best results in, in you know, making these games. So like, you know, for me, like I would never give myself credit for, you know, making the games that, you know, that I've been able to develop in the last 20 years, just simply because, you know, the way that I see it is like, I enable others to kind of have the means and have the tools and have the ability to kind of create games. So for me, it's just, I, I would say that, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess the the important thing as a kind of like co-founder and, and I would say leader in some ways has just been having the ability to kind of enable others to make cool stuff. Hopefully that answers uh, part of the question. All right, so we are, uh, the time is, is almost, we are in the last minutes. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for the licenses to your game. Uh, that, that's right, that's right, all right. Uh, and just just one last question. We we said we would say uh, the scratch the scratch creator is Zage or Zage. I I I also don't know how to pronounce his his or her it's name. Zage. Zage. All right. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Really. Uh. Yeah. I'm really happy to you know joined you and answered some questions. So you know, good luck with your your game creation endeavors and you know if there are any questions like always feel free to reach out to me i think zach has my info so yeah I, we, I'm will, around. we will definitely share with you uh all create like creations made with this asset pack uh and we will highlight some of the best ones that uh you should try to play yourself yeah. for all of them i, I mean there's no yeah. best one they're all, they're all great well you know what Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it, try a moonshot here. If we could get like a reaction video or something of you playing some of these games, even like a couple, it would be super cool. I think uh, it, it could be just like on the uh, the emulator on the web. Mm -hmm. um, but if we could get some reactions, even just like uh, uh, textual responses from you on specific games. That would be amazing. All right. Yeah. No, I can look into it. Just, uh, I guess, remind me. <laughs> we'll make I'm, it I'm super easy place, for so. you. Super yeah. easy. Yeah. No, it sounds great. Awesome. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. Bye. Thank Take you care. so Thank much. You. Bye. Right. Bye Thanks so Lucas. much. Yeah. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye -bye. Lucas, Marius, you did a great Thank job. Thank you. Yep. Awesome. Great, Lucas. Thank, you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everyone who joined.